This dungeon has a hidden bonus affix. Your camera. Did the level designers making it know which game it was for? Hi, it's Lerald, and today I'm going to be talking about Waycrest Manor. It's a pretty good dungeon. It has great aesthetics, it's very spooky, and it has sort of a haunted house ride vibe. There's great voice lines in here and some really amazing sound design. And there's a lot of good loot from here too. But there are plenty of downsides. First off, it's too long. It has five bosses and a 37 minute timer. It doesn't feel tight. I wouldn't say it feels hard, but it is too long. The walls are also too narrow. This is the main issue. I can't see anything while I'm in here. I've gotten used to just sort of fumbling my way around in here without being able to see, but getting there has been annoying. With that said, I like this dungeon a lot. It's just too long. When you're doing mid-season weekly vault keys on alts, you want something fast and rewarding. This dungeon has a great atmosphere, it's fun, and it's a good change of pace, but it's not my usual choice of dungeon for getting the weekly chores done, because it's just too long. Now for the usual disclaimer, before I walk through the route, my goal is to talk about what I do to maximize the group's chances of finishing the dungeon easily and relatively quickly, and limit the possibility for other players to make mistakes. This is specifically oriented toward pug groups, and it is definitely not the most efficient route possible, which is totally fine. You can pull more aggressively if your group is up to it. With that being said, this route should be fine all the way from a plus 2 up to about a 24 or a 25, and for higher levels I would be more aggressive throughout the entire dungeon. Now here is my MDT route for this dungeon, it's on the screen right now. I'll put a paste bin link to copy the import string into your MDT in the pinned comment, and I, as always, recommend using MDT. It's a great add-on. Alright, so let's actually walk through this MDT. For the first pull, I like to get all of the soul essences that are in the front foyer. This can be a little bit dangerous on bursting and bolstering weeks. At the end of the pull, they can be a little nasty, but these mobs are all crowd controllable. They're all silenceable, stunnable, all the usual stuff. So you can kind of, uh, in addition to cleaving them down, CC them down as well, especially toward the end of the pack, and that will help you out a lot. I do like to lust this pull. As soon as they're dead, we come through this door over here on the left-hand side of the foyer, and we make our way into the front hallway. We pull this patrol, the Bewitch Captain and Enthralled Guard, and I like to get the Bewitch Captain and Enthralled Guard that are just standing over here right at the corner of the next front hallway area. And then also you have a random pair of mob spawns throughout the dungeon that I'll sort of talk about now. This Heartsbane Runeweaver here in the front hallway, this Heartsbane Soul Charmer slightly back from that front hallway, and this Heartsbane Runeweaver all the way over here in the kitchen, are part of a weekly uh, randomly assigned spawn set where two of these three ladies will spawn and which two you get depends on the weekly uh, weekly rotation. So you don't really know until you've gotten in there unless you have it memorized, which good for you, I certainly don't. And you just kind of have to play it as, as they come out. So in this front hallway here, this side hallway here, ideally you're gonna get the Heartsbane Runeweaver, she's usually up, and you'll get the Bewitch Captain Enthralled Guard, and then the next Bewitch Captain and Enthralled Guard. The Heartsbane Runeweaver has Etch and Runic Mark. Uh, Etch deals a lot of damage, she'll just turn and focus somebody down. It's not interruptible. What is interruptible is the Bewitched Captain who casts Spirited Defense. It applies a, this tooltip is actually wrong, I believe it's a 50% damage reduction for 10 seconds. And it's not a three second cooldown in practice, they cast it more like every 20 seconds or so, but it is an AoE shield wall and they can apply it to all of their group. It is dispellable, so demon hunters, blood elves have a bit of an advantage here, but it's really best to make sure you focus these bewitch captains and interrupt them so that they don't get that off. You only have to deal with them in three pulls and they're all over here in this side of the dungeon, so... It's not too bad, but you want to be prepared for it. They also cast Shadow Cleave, which is a frontal cone that deals a massive amount of damage, so you also want to keep these bad boys, both of these Bewitch Captains, facing a wall at all times. If you need to move them around for any reason, uh, try to do that immediately after they've cast a Shadow Cleave. 
Once you come to this next area here, you have two pulls on the side rooms before you do the sisters. It's important to do these two pulls. You definitely don't want to have them add in while you're fighting the boss. And the Thistle Acolytes will spam cast Infected Thorn, which deals a bunch of upfront damage and also applies a really dangerous disease. It is dispellable, but you're better off uh, tagging these guys and then line assigning them back. I try to do both pulls at once, so I'll actually do both of these at the same time. Like this, I will tag one with whatever options I have. Maybe it's Judgment and Avenger Shield. That's sort of the ideal version. Maybe it's like Crackling Jade Lightning and Heroic Throw. But either way, I will tag both of these two sets because they are linked. Uh, the Frogs and the Acolyte are linked in each set. So you tag both of them, step back all the way out of line of sight, tell your group you're line of sighting everything back, and then cleave it down and out here. The Blight Toads, when they die, cast Toad Blight, which leaves a disorienting pool on the ground, so you want to move away from those. It's significantly more dangerous than Sanguine. It will CC you, and then the enemies that are left in the pack will attack other people in your group, and you don't want that. After that, you deal with the Sisters, you do that fight, and then you move forward into the front hallway. There is this Bewitched Captain and Enthralled Guard patrol that patrols all the way out here to this Runic Disciple and to Enthralled Guard pack and they will patrol all the way up the stairs. For me, it's really important to get this patrol just because if anybody dies, they're going to be coming back, running through the left side and coming all the way to wherever the group is by that point. And you really don't want them running into a patrol and dying again along the way. That can really make people get tilted, leave, that sort of thing. So it's important to just pick these guys up, even if you have to go up the stairs a bit and bring them back down to get them, pull all this stuff together. And if the Heartsbane Soul Charmer is up, you want to deal with it during this pull as well. One little tip about the Heartsbane Soul Charmers is, well, I guess two things. First of all, they have both Soul Bolt and Soul Volley, both of which are interruptible. It's really important to key on, on, on the Soul Volleys, but the Soul Bolts are also important. They do a lot of damage. And they cast Warding Candles, which, like the Witch Captain Spirit of Defense, is basically a... Uh, shield wall on all their allies. The difference here is that the Warden Candles, you can just move enemies out of. You do have to interrupt their Soul Bolts, though they will just stand still and spam cast in the Warden Candles, which is why these guys are annoying. If you're in a situation where you don't have interrupt available, nobody's interrupting, you, you know, and you're like over here, I'm gesturing on the on the screen, you can light of sight around a corner. Any of these little corners will do, and that will make them walk out of their candles to come get in melee range of you to then continue spam casting on the group. Once you've dealt with all of this stuff, I like to come out this front hallway into the big, I don't know what this is called, atrium maybe, and I like to pick up the hounds before I pull into anything else. If it is a bursting week, bolstering week, spiteful week, that is really most weeks. I like to get the hounds and deal with all of them before moving on into any of the rest of the pulls. The first pull here, this Coven Sh Thorn Shaper, is the only, like, major mob in the pull, and the Coven Thorn Shapers seem very easy if you're on a Vengeance Team and a Hunter or a Protection Paladin, something that can spam Interrupt, or you just have really good Interrupts in the group, then dealing with them is easy. They cast Infected Thorn, which, just like the Thorn Weavers in, in the first boss's room, deals a lot of damage and, more importantly, applies a very dangerous disease. Once you've dealt with these guys here, the, the dogs will die pretty quickly. The Thorn Shapers, you know, I try to only pull two of them at a time. I try not to pull this pack uh, down here into this number eight pull, but you can if you're on a Vengeance Demon Hunter, because again, the only thing that these guys do that is particularly dangerous is the Infected Thorn. They cast Uproot at people's location, but all they have to do to deal with that is sidestep it, and then it doesn't do anything. The Thorn Guards don't really do a lot. They do some damage to the tank, of course, but the main mechanic they have is that when they die, they do an explosion on a short delay. So I like to come over and get this pull here in the corner. Then I do this pull here, which is only two mobs. So I like to grab some mobs out of the next hallway, like on the way to roll and clean that up. And then I clean up the two Thorn Shapers and Matron Brindle before the Soulbound Goliath. Now, at this point, you kind of have a decision. If you're just doing sort of a speedy key, I just W it, I just hold W, I kill Soulbound Goliath there, and then I continue through the rest of the dungeon. If you're doing more of a push key, a harder key, or whatever, you can either continue pulling trash before 
Soulbound Goliath until Bloodlust is available, or you can continue pulling trash all the way up into and including killing Raul the Gluttonous, and then go to Soulbound Goliath as the third boss. Either is fine, it's really up to you. Now in this next hallway, we have a lot of pulls that we have to do, and the way that I deal with this, and I'll show video of it, is I set a marker right here. I'm, I'm gesturing with my mouse right here outside the door into all of Rawls Halls. And I tell the group, I'm gonna pull all this stuff out, just wait out here. I set a marker, I ping, I make it clear that I want people to stay outside. Then I go in, tag stuff, use defensive cooldowns as needed, and pull it all outside and try to pick it up, really, really focus on doing a lot of AoE damage as stuff rounds the corner. The main mobs to watch out for in this area are the Pallid Gorgers. They jump away and attack people and then will cast Wretch, which deals a cone of damage and that is pretty deadly if it's not interrupted or, or handled correctly. The only other mobs that are really noteworthy are the infected peasants. They explode with a bunch of uh, worms in them when they die. The worms will cast infest. You can deal with this with AoE CCs or direct interrupts. And then the banquet stewards. The banquet stewards cast dinner bell, and that is the main reason that we like to fight all of this stuff out in the courtyard. It is a big circle that deals a... I want to say five second or so silence. It's a long, annoying silence and it deals a lot of damage. So you want to give people the room to maneuver around. Now, one of the nicest things about all of the trash in this area is that it, for the most part, it doesn't bolster or burst. Like all of these little maggots don't bolster and burst. I don't remember. I think the piglets do, but there's really not that many mobs that bolster and burst in these pulls. Like this, this pack right here, giant pack. It's only four bolster burst mobs. This pack here, bunch of mobs in it, three. This pack here, ton of mobs in it, two bolster slash bursts. So the most dangerous pull is probably this one that you step first foot into Rawl's room and you pick up this patrolling banquet steward, which is really important to get and make sure that he is dead before you pull Rawl, having made that mistake once or twice. Really important to make sure that you've killed one here that's patrolling through the main hall, one on the left side, one on the right side, and that's it. Three banquet stewards in Rawl's room. You want to get all three of those guys dealt with before you kill Rawl. Now, it's also important to make sure that you get the piggy and the worms over here on the right side. You don't have to come all the way into this front hallway here. Just these, what is this? Uh, an infected peasant and six worms, and then a piggy and three worms. So nine worms and two guys all the way out here on the right hand side, because when Brawl casts Call Servants, I believe is the name. Sometimes those servants will spawn all the way out here, and I don't think that they pull the piggies and the worms on their own, but I think player mechanics hitting them can chain off and pull them, and in any case, you don't want that to happen. Once you've killed Rawl, then you can go into the kitchen and deal with the, either just the Devouring Maggots, which is a very easy pull, or the Devouring Maggots and this very irritating Heartsbane Runeweaver, which is uh, less fun. Once you deal with them, you go downstairs, and now here's where we have our first jump in the map. This downstairs area skips all the way over to here, where I've written 88.86%. 88.86% is the magic number that you need to go down this spiral staircase to the final two bosses. You need to have at least 88.86%. I've written it all over the all over the MDT here like a madman, just to kind of demonstrate this is the number you need. It's really important. So you'll come in right here, and there'll be this first pull with a Coven Thorn Shaper and four Jagged Hounds. It's just like this pull right in the middle of the uh, large atrium area. The courtyard, I guess, is what it is. There's also Matron Alma, who you will want to pick up. You pull her over there, deal with her along with the Jagged Hounds and the Coven Thorn Shaper, and you're good to go. That should put you at 88.86%, or above that, technically a little bit more like 89%. The one thing I would say with Matron Alma is if it's a bursting or bolstering week, bursting's not so bad, but if it's a bolstering week, I would try to kind of wait until I'd gotten the Jagged Hounds dead before I pull her in because I would just rather not have her be bolstered four times. She casts Ruinous Volley, you want to interrupt that, but then the Coven Thorn Shaper is also vying for Infected Thorn interrupts, so you just don't want to have her doing any extra damage if you can help it. 
and once they're all dead, you hug this corner and you walk down the stairs. It's really, really easy to do. I've seen so many people just cut right along. I'll draw it freehand here. Just cut like this and then they pull these guys down here. If that happens, it's not the end of the world. It is one of the most important things to be prepared for in tanking this dungeon is, you know, I come over here, I, I ping the corner, I hug it all the way around and walk straight forward. Very easy to do, but I'm always, always watching for somebody to just walk directly through the Heartsbane Rune, Rune Weaver and Bewitch Captain. And if they do, I pull out, I come right here into this middle of this room, I ping it a bunch of times and make everybody come back and fight it there. And then, you know, they, I'll let them take care of chastising the person who made the mistake. Once we come down the spiral staircase, we have two pulls that I think are really important not to pull together. They are incredibly dangerous when pulled together if the group isn't ready for the amount of interrupt load that is required. There are two Heartsbane Soul Charmers downstairs, as well as this Coven Diviner. It's the only one that you'll fight in the dungeon. It just casts Fragment Soul, or I don't know that I've ever actually seen that. Uh, I guess it's instant. It casts Soul Bolt, so it vies for a lot of interrupts. It has a lot of interrupt pressure. There are also some Soul Essences that'll just random target uh, Scar Soul, which can be nasty in conjunction with the other mechanics if that hits at the same time as the other mechanics in this area. Here you have to deal with these two Heartsbane Soul Charmers. They cast Warden Candles, they cast Soul Bolt, and they cast Soul Volley. There's a tendency of people because of this little staircase here to like sidestep around stuff and fall into the soul charmer. And so I really like to try and make sure that people stay up on this ramp and keep them up along the walls here until we've killed off the soul charmer. It's not that deadly. You definitely can deal with both of the soul charmers at once, but everyone needs to be interrupting well. They need to be kicking all of the soul volleys. They need to be kicking the soul bolts so that you can pull mobs out of the warding candles when they go down and they're going to be going down fairly often. So it really creates a lot of pressure on the group to try and do these two pulls together. And I just don't love it. Not that it is unmanageable if it happens, but I've definitely seen a lot of groups accidentally run into the second pack and then immediately wipe because they couldn't get the interrupts going that they needed. Once you've dealt with these two poles, you've dealt with Lord and Lady Waycrest, you're on to the final pole of the dungeon, and one of the most fun, the Gloom Horrors, they only have one mechanic, they jump to enemies and do a little AoE cleave, and there are, what is this, seven of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them, and they're just really fun to AoE down. You can set Ring of Peace or Ursal's Vortex, you can use AoE stuns, leg sweep, all that kind of thing. Any sort of AoE CC, AoE burst damage on these guys is really, really good. You burn them all down, and then you go kill Gorak Tool down here, and you're done. And that's Waycrest Manor. Pretty fun dungeon, kinda long though. Now as for when you want to Bloodlust, I want to always do it on the first pull, regardless of whether it's Fortified or Tyrannical Week and then use it on the second boss and the final boss. The second boss is usually Soulbound Goliath. The second boss is usually Soulbound Goliath, but depending on what route and so on that you're going, maybe you kill that guy and you get to uh, Rawl before you have Bloodlust up. Hey, that's totally fine. Again, any sort of situation where you're moving faster than the Bloodlust timer means that the dungeon is going well and it's not something to be upset about. Now let's talk about bosses and we'll start with the Heartsbane Triad. This is a three boss fight, but only one boss is active at a time, so it is a pure single target fight disguised as a council fight. The main mechanic of this fight is the focusing iris. The sisters are attackable if they have the iris and they get 99% damage reduction if they don't. While they have the iris, they gain a passive aura and an active skill. Otherwise, they just spam cast a basic spell. They drop the iris at 50% health or so, and they rotate through each of the sisters once, and then you kill them on the second rotation. The order of the sisters is Selena, Malady, and Briar. That's middle, right, and left. One of the biggest tips I have for tanks on this fight is to focus the next sister and pre-taunt it. This is really more important for the first rotation through, but that pre-taunting can really save lives. You have a second or two before the new sister has claimed the iris, and the first auto attack that a newly active sister has can kill a melee DPS, and because they all have 99% DR before they're attackable, they will probably not have any threat from you. You know, you're gonna be doing 1% damage. That's really not enough to establish threat. So getting that early taunt just a second or two before it activates is immensely valuable. Now let's talk about each of the sisters. 
Selena's aura is Aura of Apathy. It applies a 50% Mortal Strike to the group, so healing during this section is pretty hard. Her main active skill is Soul Manipulation. It's a mind control. She chooses a random target, grants herself 99% damage reduction, and the group has to swap to the mind control target and bring them below 50% health. I think the most important part of this mechanic is don't kill them. I've played with Frost Mages who hit a mind control target with like, I don't know, Ebon Bolt or whatever, and just one bang them from full to dead. Don't do that. You just bring them down to 50% steadily, but <laughs> not all in one big burst. And that's pretty much all that there is to this boss. Malady is the second sister, and her aura is probably the most dangerous. It's Aura of Dread. It applies a rapidly stacking damage over time effect, but moving clears the stacks. It resets them to one. So as a tank, you can just constantly move. Jumping works. That's great. Her active skill is Unstable Runic Mark. You have to spread out for that. It explodes in a small AoE, dealing damage to anybody nearby, but it's about a five yard radius, so it's pretty easy for the whole group to just spread out. It's just a forced movement mechanic. The third sister is Sister Briar. Her aura is Aura of Thorns, and she reflects physical damage every time she is hit. Her active skill is Jagged Nettles. It's a spell, it deals some upfront damage, and applies a bleed that lasts until the target is healed back up to 90% health. That bleed can be removed with Blessing of Protection, or Dwarf Racial, as always. And Spot Healing, if you can provide it, is really, really helpful in dealing with this mechanic. So once again, pre-taunting is really, really important on this fight, especially for the first rotation through the sisters. Your main objective as the tank is just to help interrupt and focus down the active sister. Interrupts are a kind of a free-for-all on all of the targets in this fight, but focusing down the active sister is important. You don't want to be wasting any of your damage into a sister that's functionally immune. Once you kill Selena, the difficulty drops down quite a bit. Malady is the most dangerous sister when you're playing with casters because they usually can't move enough to consistently clear stacks while also doing damage, and they tend to prioritize damage even at the expense of dying. Rolling more than a couple of stacks of that dread debuff on Tyrannical Weak at high key levels is a massive amount of damage, and it will really put your healer under a lot of strain. Jagged Nettles is another annoying Grievous style mechanic. If you can help the healer with it, that's great. If not, just try your best to be self-sufficient so that they can spam heal the target who is bleeding. Soulbound Goliath is the second boss in this dungeon. You can do him third depending on whether or not you're gaming the Bloodlust timer, or you can just be the second if you're holding W and just walking through the dungeon. He has five main mechanics, a ramping damage buff that gives him 5% more damage per stack and stacks every two seconds. He has Fire, which are spawned by lightning strikes around the arena in random locations. Running him into Fire will reset his stacks of the damage buff, and it causes him to radiate fire damage to the group. It also spawns Fiery Ghosts that uh, fixate on targets in the group. They don't have a threat table or, uh, I mean, they're not attackable, they're just sort of ghosts. The 10,000 IQ move for dealing with that is once you've dunked him into the fire, move the boss away from the ghosts. The sort of warrior brain move is to just run into the ghosts and get them to hit you to take him yourself, basically. I usually go with the latter. His main tank mechanic really is auto attacks, but he also has a skill called crush. It's dodgeable and blockable, and in my experience, the damage on it is pretty low until it's not. Soulthorns is his other group-oriented mechanic. It stuns a random target until the thorns are killed, and it deals a heavy amount of damage. You can Blessing of Protection people out of this. You can Touch of Death people out of this. You want to focus it down whenever it's active. The biggest variable in the fight is the fire spawn locations. If I'm going to dunk the boss in a fire, I always, always want to do it after we've rescued someone from Soulthorns and given the healer a second or two to get their health back up. There really isn't any group damage other than when he casts Soul Thorns on somebody or you dunk him in the fire, so overlapping those two is a really good way to kill someone, and you don't want to do that. Depending on the weekly affixes and which tank I'm on, I may dunk the boss once or twice, I may not dunk him at all. My rule of thumb for when to dunk him is as soon as I start worrying that he's going to one-shot me. If my health pool starts to seesaw at all and it doesn't immediately stabilize and then stay fine, at that point, I will use a cooldown and position him to dunk him as quickly as I can, while still bearing in mind the Soul Thorns overlap. Rawl is the second or third boss, depending on what route you're going with, and he's the worst boss in this dungeon. He's one of my least favorite bosses ever. 
I always complain about him whenever I'm in here. He has four main mechanics. The first is Consume All, which deals massive group-wide damage. It's basically a wipe mechanic, and he only uses it if you leave melee range, so... Never leave melee range and don't accidentally pull the boss while you're picking up trash beforehand. And then I wrote in my notes here, damn you Avenger Shield. Yes, be very careful when throwing Avenger Shield out in this room because it will chain into Rawl and then the group is wiped. We have been there a bunch of times, it's very irritating. His main actual mechanic is Tenderize. He casts three cones of damage in a row, you dodge the cones. It's that simple. He immediately casts his next skill, Call Servant. It calls servants. They have no threat table, they have no mechanics, they just spawn at the edges of the room and walk slowly toward Rawl with food. They will apply a stacking damage over time effect to the group if they reach Rawl, so it's important to deal with them before they do, and the way you deal with them is to kill them. They can be knocked back with Ring of Peace, they can be knocked around with Grip, they can be pushed back with Typhoon, or Assault's Vortex, all the usual stuff. So slow them, cleave them, easy peasy. The final mechanic of the fight is Rotten Expulsion, and boy is it annoying on every tank except for a Paladin. It summons four Bile Oozlings, and some of them spawn outside of melee range. In fact, most of them do. Bile Oozling got auto-corrected to Bill Oozling, which I found funny. Bill Oozling sounds like a zombie accountant. When these ads die, they explode after a short delay, and that initial explosion deals a lot of damage. It also leaves behind a pool on the ground, and this is why the fight sucks. Picking up the ads is annoying because a lot of them spawn out of melee range, positioning so that their pools aren't totally in the way is annoying or sometimes impossible, and on top of all of that you have to stay in melee range the entire time so that Rawl doesn't cast Consume All and kill everyone. In terms of doing the fight, it is pretty straightforward. It's kind of a fight on rails, which is I think why I don't really like it so much and why it stands out so much after the previous fight, or maybe the next fight, Soulbound Goliath, which has a ton of freedom for the tank. In this fight, you stand in front of the boss, you pick up the adds, never leave melee, you try to not soak cones or pools, that's it. It's really just the worst fight, not fun to tank at all. The fourth fight is really good. Lord and Lady Waycrest has a lot of mechanics and the tank damage can be extremely dangerous, but I find it really, really engaging. The voice acting and sound design are pretty good here too. This is a two-phase fight, and in phase one you fight Lord Waycrest. He is the main source of tank damage in the fight, and he does that with Wasting Strike. It is a nature damage spell attack thing, and it applies a five second damage over time effect that deals a lot of damage. It can be spell reflected, so warriors keep that in mind. His main damage on the group is Virulent Pathogen. It is a random damage over time effect he puts on a, on a target of his choice that's not the tank. It is a disease and it can be dispelled. It sh probably should be dispelled because it does a lot of damage over time and dispelling it gets it off earlier. Whether it expires or is dispelled, it leaves behind a circle of explosion that has like a four second delay. If it hits anybody, it will reapply virulent pathogen. So it's important for that target to get the debuff, move away a little bit from everybody, get a dispel, and then move back to where they were before. And this is why we start off by pulling the boss to the side. It gives the rest of the group room to move for the pathogen. The boss also gets a heal from Lady Waycrest. She full heals him when he hits 10% health, and she'll do that three times. Each time she does this, his damage increases slightly. It's like 3% per stack, so a very small ramp up, really not that noticeable until you're doing the pinnacles of key pushing. There's one other mechanic in phase one, and that's Lady Waycrest's Discordant Cadenza. It just throws swirlies out into the arena and you want to dodge them. It's one of the two types of swirlies that you have to deal with in this fight. In phase two, upon casting the third heal on Lord Waycrest, Lady Waycrest will teleport into the arena and you want to taunt her immediately. I start out the fight when she's way across the arena, like not targetable by focusing her so that I can focus taunt her as soon as she jumps down and focus interrupt her in all of phase two. Now Lord Waycrest will continue striking and diseasing and doing all the stuff he did in phase one. The only real change here is that instead of the swirlies on the ground, you now have to interrupt Lady Waycrest's racking cord, which just deals damage, but you still shouldn't let her cast it. You also have to burn her down. You kill both of the bosses and then you're done. Now you're moving on to the next bit of trash and the final boss. And the final boss is Gorak Tool. I love this fight. 
I know it's not a great tank fight or even a great fight at all really, but I think I like it so much because the voice work and sound design is so incredible. The voice actor really gave 100% on this character, and I think that's the main reason I like him so much. Also, fun fact I found out in uh, looking this video up, he's the voice of Kratos in all the God of War games, which I didn't realize, but knowing that now, it makes sense. So the whole presentation really just works on this fight. In terms of the mechanics, it's actually kind of simple and boring, if I'm being honest, but I still like it. As a tank fight, it's very basic. He pretty much just auto attacks. He summons adds that need to be tanked. I guess that's maybe the one complexity for a tank. The adds will cast Dark Lens, which stuns enemies, and you can crowd control them to cancel it, but you can't interrupt that spell. The boss will cast Dread Essence on a timer. It revives dead adds or heals living adds back to 100% health. So you have this need to burn the adds down quickly and not let him stack them up. There's also the mechanic Alchemical Fire, which comes out whenever you kill an ad. You pick it up and toss it onto ad corpses, and that will burn them up, and then they won't be resible with Dread Essence. This could be done by the tank, but it really is best done by a ranged DPS or a healer. Finally, the boss has one interrupt, and that's Darkened Lightning. He casts Darkened Lightning. You interrupt it before he finishes. <laughs> you know, it's a basic interrupt. It's really that simple. I start out this fight by picking up the boss, and whenever he spawns adds, I pick them up as well, and I focus them down first. I try to help crowd control and pull adds back to melee range as much as I can, but for the most part, this fight is a simple tank and spank with one interrupt and an occasional spawning ad, and the mechanic of burning the corpses, which is a cool idea, is really up to the ranged DPS or the healer. And that's Waycrest Manor. I like this dungeon a lot, my only real problem with it is the length. It's five bosses over 35 minutes, and it's just too long. I like the idea of what Blizzard was going for with this place, I really, really do. A haunted house maze is a cool idea, and it works pretty well in that context. I think it can be a little annoying with affixes like Sanguine, but they made the right call by making a huge number of the little enemies in Rawls Halls not trigger on death effects. If they could have done that to the Everbloom, that dungeon might have been pretty good too. Oh well. Alright, that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye.